Hello and welcome to uh, episode 54 of Brews Less Traveled, the podcast exploring the best uncharted craft beer scenes across the United States. I'm Brian. I'm your host. And I'm MC. I'm your co-host uh, for all the episodes featuring Missoula, Montana. Brian, how are you? Nice. I'm doing well. I, uh, I've had a, a decent week here so far. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Shout out to all our subscribers for joining us tonight. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a little injured right now. Um, Ooh, what uh, happened? I went to a metal show over the weekend. Um, I am 34 years old, and I thought I could go in the mosh pit like I did when I was in my 20s. And I hurt my ribs. So mm, it, uh, A hard lesson. Yeah, playing injured tonight. Um, but I think I'm going to be able to drink these beers just fine, despite the injury. Do you think maybe injury. a beer or two will help? Probably. Um, not an expert on the therapeutic effects of beer, although I am uh, well versed in the trials of finding out if it has therapeutic effects. Mm, well, let's give it a shot. Well, yeah, we'll figure it out. How are you doing, MC? Perfect. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, yeah busy we're getting busy at the brewery so i'm um, just a little tired from having kind of a long week kind of the days are getting a little longer my you know list of to do's get a little longer every day uh in the summer and that's just i'm just settling into that reality because i think we're going to get pretty busy this summer so yep lots of lock, lots of packaging going on lots of lots uh, of packaging production ramping up Yep, we're ramping up production and, you know, a couple of times a week, a little more often in the summer, we pack like 15 pack boxes um, so they don't get pack teched. So it's a little mm. more laborious and it's, uh, you know, a few solid hours of like some pretty fast paced beer packing. Um, and it's fun when I'm done with it, when I'm not doing it anymore. I'm like, yeah. that wasn't so bad. Um, but it's it's difficult in the moment. So I'm a little tired today, but um, happy to be here. Excited to have a couple of beers. Um, yeah, looking forward to talking about this new brewery. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we got a great, uh, another banging episode for Yins tonight. Uh, we're featuring our friends at Kettle House Brewing Company out of Missoula, of course, as we continue to make our way through this wonderful city in the state of Montana. And uh, MC and I are going to be sipping on their Hellgate Honey Hefeweizen and their cold, uh, this is always a mouthful for me, cold smoke scotch ale. Uh, yeah. Uh, shout out to our, another shout out to our subscribers. Jen's also got these uh, awesome postcards in with your boxes. Uh, got some fun facts about our breweries in there. And uh, yeah, you can check that out. Yeah. Um, and other um, than that, we're just going to dive right in, I think, with will. our guest this week, unless we you will. have something to add, Brian. We will in a second. We're having okay. some technical difficulties. Never mind. Um, yeah. I, 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 need, I need to stall here because we're having some technical difficulties. No problem. Um, let me see if I can uh, help our guest here. Um, Let's just get into the first beer. MC, you want to yeah, crack that, that, that great. Hellgate? Let's, and uh, yep. I'll, 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 I'll try to help our guest out here. Yeah, so let's, let's go ahead and crack the Hefeweizen. It's a good one to start with. In between the Hefeweizen and the Scotch Ale, Hefeweizen's a good light beer to start with. So let's go ahead and pour that. And I'm sure our listeners, watchers, know the trick to pouring a perfect Hefeweizen. But in case you don't, there's always a little yeast in with Hefeweizen and you wanna get all that yeast actually into your drink, which is a little, um, not usually what we say in the beer world, but with a Hefeweizen, you definitely do. You want that nice cloudy color. You want a big head of foam. Yeah, and I believe the last time we drank a straight up Hefeweizen on the podcast was when you were here. And I we think were joined you're right. by uh, Elizabeth from Casey Beer Co. And they, mm. we talked again about swirling, getting that, like stirring that yeast up, 
getting yes. it up into suspension for the interior. Rousing, beer. as they call it. Rousing the yeast. I might have went a little heavy on the big, oh. lar- large head part. But... Impossible. You can't go too heavy on a, on the head with a Hefeweizen, I don't think. All right. Cheers, Cheers y'all. Cheers. Oh, that is wonderfully drinkable, as evidenced by my foamy mustache there. Yeah, uh, um, mine too. Chat is uh, saying they, they like this. Um, oh, somebody in chat is addressing uh, something that we didn't bring up yet. Yes, you should grab your Kettle House beers. We were planning to have our, our DraftWorks beers tonight. Um, but we are featuring a different brewery, a little bit of uh, more scheduling issues. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. But there's always that. people that want to hang out and drink beer with us and talk beer with us. So, yeah, we were able to get around the scheduling issues. Yep. So I do have to say Hefeweizen is not a beer, I, a, a style I typically order. If I'm trying hmm. a bunch of beers, maybe, but I'm I definitely not somebody that's going to order a pint of half a Weizen when I when I go to a brewery, but this it's very nice and enjoyable. I feel like every time I have a half a Weizen, I'm, this this is a style I should probably drink more often. Yeah, I so. mean, style preferences change. I feel like season to season, week to week. You know, this one's a little yeah. grainier, a little breadier. It's kind of like a little bready and a little honeyish, obviously, because they brew it with a little honey. Um, but a, a little less um, estery and like clovey banana y that, you know, that that isn't so present, which may make it a little bit more approachable for people that don't usually do half of license. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely. That's kind of the thing that I don't know, maybe turns me off of the half of Weizen's is that, yeah, that bubble gum, uh, circus peanut, yeah, clovey ester. Ester and phenolic thing going on with Hefeweizen, and, and it's very subdued in here. It kind of blends yeah. in. It's it's a little bit there, but yeah, there's a lot of beautiful grain flavor to this. Um, it's a really nice, well-rounded beer. Whereas you know, usually right. the Hefeweizen, it's just uh, you know really driven by that fermentation character. Yeah. MC yep. stalling over. Okay, I did my best. <laughs> Okay, okay, so if stalling is over, then that means that we're ready to jump in with our we guest. Are, we, are, um, we are ready, yes. Yep, who is the brand engagement manager at Kettle House Brewing, Al Pills. Al, welcome. Hey, Al, how's it going? I'm well. How are you guys? We're good. Much better now. Yeah, Definitely. sorry about sorry about the technical difficulties. I guess I'm showing my age here. Al, okay. I've done this like three times, and last week I came on to the recording muted. So <laughs> don't worry about it at all. Well, I was just having a conversation with one of my coworkers about how we should all be better at this at this point in our lives. Yeah, I mean we're all pretty pretty practiced in it. I right. literally get paid to do this stuff on Zoom, and I still make mistakes. So yep. you know, we'll we'll all figure out tech, technology. We're here. We're drinking. We're talking. Al, can you tell us more about the Hellgate Honey Hefeweizen? Uh, absolutely. Did you guys already do like the stats rundown and whatnot? Not really. Uh, we could do that real quick. 4.8% I mean, ABV, 16 yep. IBUs. Yep. Uh, so very smooth and malty. You know, obviously a half, even an American style half should be very malt forward. Um, also, it should tell us by the name hellgate honey half that there's honey involved with it so we use honey from a local uh, apiary around here or is that the right word airy no is that a, eagles a- apiary i think i'm confusing I, it i think you're right eagles nest and a uh and a bee factory there a little bit but yeah there's some local uh, honey producers and they're just like a mom and pop operation that we've been working with for years and it's just delicious honey and it just kind of adds that little bit of sweetness to the beer um I think one of the secrets of, of beer is that a lot of people like sweet, a uh, slightly sweet beer, even though they might not list that on their top, you know, uh, attributes of what they like in a beer. So the, the half of ice and definitely checks that box. I think you're onto something there with uh, sweetness. Yeah. New I England agree. IPAs kind of taking over. 
Well, and oh, even sure. in an IPA, if it's not sweet enough, people don't, you know, it's not balanced. It's almost like people don't know that they want sweetness until it's missing. Right. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, great description. Would you consider this an American style Hefeweizen? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, we do use, use a, a half style yeast for it. You know, we're not using like Cali ale or anything on this one, but um, it's definitely American style. You know, it doesn't really have like the uh, European, like clove, banana pepper kind of thing going. I mean, which is delicious as well. Don't get me wrong, but that's, we just chose to go for this style with this beer. Yep. Yeah. We were just commenting that we really like that about this beer, that it's maybe a little more approachable because of that. So yeah. Um, for sure. For yeah. Sure. Well, Al, I have never heard of a brand engagement manager. What is it that a brand engagement manager does? Well, uh, that's a great question. And it honestly took me a minute to even, you know, kind of conceive of what that would be. Um, so to take a step back, uh, I've worked at the Kettle House for over 20 years in many different um, forms. Uh, started out in the tap room, mopping coolers, washing kegs, then serving and managing the tap room. Then I was later became our first salesperson. Um, and I did that for about 10 years. And then we kind of started adding a bunch of territories and we hired some other salespeople. And we realized we needed a little bit of depth in our field there. You know, it's like, we were kind of, uh, we're big for a Montana brewery, but small for a regional brewery. And, um, but as we grew, we added, uh, you know, layers to our sales force. And we kind of, you know, looked at ourselves as a company in the mirror and had to decide what we were individually really good at. And I think that um, the powers that be at the brewery saw me as like the person that tells the story of the brewery, the person that gets out there and works with key accounts and keeps the ball rolling and kind of touches base with all our territories and all of our different distributors just to make sure the thing is going forward. You know, our our, uh, wholesale sales manager does more of the X's and O's, you know, like fulfilling orders, working with, you know, Albertson's corporate to make sure this is right or that is right. where I kind of just like float around to all of our markets. Um, Cause at one time I was our only salesperson. Um, but now that we have a few other people, it's, it's fun to have this role. It also means um, doing things like hosting people when they come to visit us um, and hosting people that come to concerts at the amphitheater that's on our property and things like that. And so I really enjoy that. I mean, beer and music, boy. I feel like it's kind of a dream come true. So uh, brand engagement manager, I still didn't define it very well, but we, I kind of do a lot of everything. And um, I'm kind of the jack of all trades, master of none guy, you know, but it, it's fun. It's every day is a little bit different. Um, today I'm talking to you nice people. Uh, yesterday I was, you know, doing more just like direct, you know, dealings with some of our key accounts in Missoula. Um You know, I'll go to a beer fest. I'll do all kinds of stuff. So it's a wide net, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the great thing when, when breweries grow, you get to, you get to find those specialized positions for people that have been loyal to the company and and have helped build it up as a brand. And it really gives, it's really nice to see people get those opportunities to, you know, basically preach what they love about the, the, you know, it, it. If I was a brewery owner, I would love to have somebody in that position because. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. Goes yeah, a long it, way. It does. And it was 20 yeah. years under your belt. Right. You know, so our, our owner feels comfortable with me, you know, blabbing on and on uh, to people and I won't, you know, I'm going to say the right things and, you know, I'll, I'll further the brand, um, so to speak. So, I mean, a lot of it is still sales based really, but a lot of it is kind of like, 30,000 foot big idea stuff too. Awesome. And uh, with a last name like Pills, uh, (laughs) it seems destined that Kettle House would have a Pilsner named for you. Um, Have have they done that? Absolutely. You know, it's funny that you should say that. Uh, We just canned uh, Al Pills uh, yesterday. That's amazing. Yeah, I think you could kind of see the 
the keg down at June 7th. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, just canned it yesterday. Both uh, The guys in production really like to sneak up on me with that one. Uh, we made the first, well, we've made it on and off for years, an Al Pilsner, a different version here and there. Um, but our uh, one of our newer uh, lead brewers um, is an excellent uh, Pilsner lager touch. And he made one last summer that was just delicious. And I loved it. They surprised me with this label, you know, it took, took some picture of me at, out at a beer fest or something and put it on there for my 20th anniversary at the brewery. Um, surprised me with it. And then yesterday I get an email, Hey, by the way, we just canned out, we just canned you today, you know, stop by and grab a case. So I drove out there this morning and grabbed a case of it. Wow. That's awesome. But yeah, yeah I mean, so with, a, with a name like Pills, you better have a beer named after you if you work at a brewery for 20 years. We've had, mm-hmm. uh, we've had a Joel Brown, a Colleen Bitters, uh, a Tim Stout, a Tracy Beer. Wait, wait, are these, are these beers that you've made or are these, are these people that you've employed? These are pe- people that have worked at the brewery. So what oh, my God. Oh Joel my Brown, God. Tim Those Stout. are the real names? Yeah. Oh Tim, my gosh. Colleen Bitters, Tracy Beer. <laughs> Al Pills and uh, Frankie Dunkelweisen. Oh my God. No, can, Dunkelweisen? Can, no, yeah, just kidding about the Dunkelweisen. Oh, I was but like, I'll, that can't be I'll, real. <laughs> I've, I've told that joke at least a hundred times. And every time I, love I get, it. every time I get a chuckle out of my owner, he knows it's coming and he just still laughs anyways. But yeah, the, the Frankie Dunkelweisen part is just to see if you guys are paying attention. And I could tell that you are. So thank you for that. Well, uh, as somebody that works HR in uh, the daytime, I would like to put my uh, recruiting person in touch with your recruiting person as to how we can find people with more colorful names. Right? I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of funny, right? Yeah. That's, that's exclusively how Brian amazing. is going to hire from now on. Do you yeah. have a name <laughs> semi-related to beer? Great. Yeah, f- You're hired. Phone book, phone book based hiring. I think that would be Perfect. really a, a sound practice in 2022, right? <laughs> so al you guys are the second uh largest brewery in all of montana um and so you talk a little bit about it but can you tell us more about you know what's it been like for you for 20 years to be a part of the growth of uh this brewery um well it's been really fun you know we're a mom and pop operation and interestingly enough, I lived across the street from our original location right before it opened. That space used to be a clay studio, which is cool, you know, but um, breweries are cooler, in my opinion. And uh, so mm-hmm. I remember sitting with my buddies in the summer of 1995 on a porch, watching Tim and Susie, our founders, hang a banner over the garage door, coming soon, you brew, right? So a you brew is literally you brew it. You walk in, you point out a recipe and somebody helps you make it. You either make a keg or a bunch of bottles. We were doing 22 bottles, 22 ounce bottles back then. People would make their own label and they'd come back after the beer was done and and either put it in the keg and bring it home or bottle it and then label the bottles. So with the Montana laws, the way they were at the time, you couldn't sell a pint across the plank in a brewery. So I didn't work there then, but me and my dumb roommates brewed one of the first barrels of beer in Kettle House's history, and that was in 95. Now, fast forward to 2001, and I had a buddy who worked there at the time, and he said, hey, we need, cut, we need somebody to help out with blah, blah, blah. So I went in and bugged them long enough, and they finally gave me a job. Um, so back then in 2001, I want to say we made about 850 barrels of beer a year, um, which seemed like a lot at the time we were busy, you know, all the tanks were full. I remember when we reached a thousand barrels, we were like high five in each other and thinking we'd really like made it or something. That's um, a lot of beer when you're brewing small batches. Oh, it yeah. was, we had a 14 barrel brew house at the time. Um, so yeah, it seemed like a lot. And then. You know, for context, fast forward to 2016, when we, uh, or 2017, when we opened up the Bonner facility, um, and in that first week of being open, we packaged 650 barrels of beer. So like from, you know, 850 in a whole year to, you know, almost 20, you know, 15, 16 years later to making almost that, to packaging almost that in a week. So 
you know, last year we were just around just over 25,000 barrels of beer last year. Um, so it feels weird, kind of like I'm a sentimental guy, you know, I'm always like, ah, you know, and so it feels weird to kind of have like that, you know, that level of production these days, but it also just seems natural. You know, it doesn't feel forced. Um, I feel like that's one of our big successes is that, you know, we tried to go, uh, you know, a mile deep, not a mile wide. You know, we really tried to own Missoula as much as we could before we left that, you know, so we were Missoula only forever then we were Missoula Bozeman uh, forever. And then we added the Flathead and Helena and Great Falls. And then we started selling too much beer and we literally had to pull out of Helena Great Falls and the Flathead. And that was a really painful time because there's a lot of really bummed out people that didn't understand how we couldn't, but it's just the way it was. We had physical constraints. We were trying to add on. We built another brewery in the meantime on the north side of Missoula. Um, that was our production facility for you know almost 10 years. And we made 9,999 barrels of beer a year there. Um, and we outgrew that. You know, and if anything, some of our biggest mistakes have been that we haven't dreamt big enough, you know. Um, so we had these these physical constraints. And then along the way, there's complications with the Montana laws, the way they were at the time. If you sold over 10,000 barrels of beer a year, you couldn't operate a tap room. So mm. the, tap, the tap room is like a huge part of craft beer. Um, it's where your loyal fans show up and and drink your beer and socialize and hang out. You know, so um, it's been an interesting ride, but it's been great. Um, yeah, and it, and we're still kind of Trent. We keep ticking upwards every year. Um, Cold Smoke, our fra our flagship beer, you know, arguably the most popular beer in Montana, um, keeps growing every year. So that's that's awesome. You know, it just speaks to the strength of everything. Let's take a beer break and talk about one of the coolest ways to explore the Missoula beer scene. River City Brews offers beer lovers a chance to explore Missoula's rivers while enjoying the best of the city's craft beers. These guys will pick you up at your favorite local Missoula brewery, and after grabbing some beer to go, you'll make your way to one of Missoula's beautiful waterways. You'll then embark on a scenic float down the Clark Fork or Blackfoot River while enjoying breathtaking views, calm waterways, and of course, great local craft beer. They offer afternoon and evening public tours and also customizable private tours. They're entering their fifth season of tours, and you can find more about these really awesome tours at rivercitybrews.com. Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, and uh, well, speaking of cold smoke, let's. Uh, I think it's time to get into the second beer. I'm going to open up this cold smoke. You mentioned that it's one of the most beloved beers in uh, in Montana, one of the best-selling craft beers in all of Montana. Could you tell us more about this beer? I'm surprised Absolutely. when I heard that uh, a Scotch Ale is your flagship. That's well, what I was thinking. It's a little goofy, you know? I mean, and if you, again, kind of doubling back to what we were talking about earlier with the half of ice and the sweetness, um, malt-forward beers tend to be a little bit sweet, you know? And again, people... You know, cold smoke lovers might not necessarily list sweetness as one of its attributes, but it definitely is, in my opinion. Excuse me. Um, so that beer is is Tim, our owner's uh, passion project. You know, he fell in love with a Scotch ale he had one time, and he drank it whenever he could find it. It was some import beer that I can't even remember the name of right now, but he thought, you know, if I could just tweak it a little bit here, here, and here it'd be even better. And he did. And it took him a hot minute, but he came up with it. Um, and he, um, you know, is a really passionate, really um, insightful guy who has an incredible palate as well, you know, and that really helped him kind of hone this beer in. Um, so it started out as a seasonal. We actually had a, a contest in the tap room named this beer. And the uh, tap room winner at the time was Big Pipe Scotch Ale, you know, like a, a like a, a, a bagpipes, right? Big Pipes. Mm -hmm. So, mm. which is a cool enough name, right? 
But Tim, in his infinite wisdom, decided that he needed a winter beer that he could sell to ski areas and write off ski trips and get on tap at his favorite places in Montana, places like Bridger Bowl. And, uh, and, and honestly, our first whack at that winter seasonal was, uh, was our old bong water hemp porter, you know, because even back in the nineties, as we were right, as you're riding the chairlift, you know, you get a certain, uh, Hey, look at that. You get certain wafts of a certain aroma that, you know, some, some shredder guy in front of you might be doing on the chairlift. So he thought that was the way it never caught on, you know, Bridger Bowl is kind of a family forward place. And Bridger Bowl is known for its light powder snow, and they call it, you know, skiing the cold smoke. So we went with cold smoke Scotch Ale as our winter beer. There's a skier on the front. And uh, what it, you know, what it really truly means is, you know, skiing that light fluffy snow, and it kind of makes a vapor trail behind you that looks like smoke. And if you're a skier, you know, these days, everybody's all about the powder. So that was kind of what we were going for there. And it was a winter seasonal. And then we stopped making it in the summer and people freaked out about it. I never thought that this beer would be something, but they would freak out about it. So we just started making it all year round and it kept selling all year round. It sold more in August than it did in January. Um, just because that's a bigger sales month in general. But that was weird to me. Um, and I think really it's the perfect culmination of things. The best beer um the best selling beers you know have a they're great beers to begin with but they need the marketing behind it and cold smoke just sounds light and easy um and I, so i think people kind of and it was catchy cold smoke cold smoke people could remember that you know so it really became this cult thing um and it's really the reason why we are who we are today um it represents probably half of our annual production um so you know it's been a uh it's been a great success story it's been a really fun fun ride and like i said it's been rolling for dang near 20 years and every year selling more and more and more so i mean it's one uh let's see gabf bronze it's won a world cup world beer cup bronze as well i want to say wow and a bunch of bunch of smaller, you know, Idaho Falls kind of awards, but really the ultimate testimonial in my awards are great. Don't get me wrong. They are great. And it's really a pat on the back to the brewers, you know, because they're hardworking folks and that's how they get their kind of, you know, their due recognition or so. But to me, it's like when some guy freaks out about driving here from Fargo, North Dakota and buys you know, 17 cases to bring back to his family reunion. Like that's, that's my award. You know, when the guy stops me in the grocery store and is like, I used to think Miller Lite was my favorite beer of all time, but now I drink cold smoke and it's the best thing ever, you know? So uh, we had a server one time in Big Sky, Montana say that cold smoke, uh, let's see, how did he say that? Cold smoke makes uh, light beer, turns light beer drinkers into dark beer lovers because the you know it's smooth and easy uh it's 11 ibus you know which is basically what a bud miller coors is you know so that you know there's that arms race in the in the ipa segment and it's hyper competitive and it's ever changing and it's hyper local and all that stuff but the bigger venn diagram of beer drinkers is our american light lager drinkers and if you can convert some of those guys to the dark side you're really on to something, right? So that's kind of the secret sauce of cold smoke. And it's a, just a damn good beer, you know? Craft and beer this lovers is, like it, and so do newbies. So that's a that's a heck of a thing. And yeah. this is the perfect beer to turn people into dark beer. It has those beautiful roast characters. It's got nice dark fruit, but there isn't that big body in the middle that I think turns a lot of people off. And it has a no. nice finish that doesn't linger around too long. It's... Yep blown it's, away that it's six and a half percent too it's slightly yeah. you know slightly coffee-esque or slightly uh, toffee-esque mm -hmm. um i've had people compare it to a coca-cola um and that one kind of blew me away at first and then i kind of you know especially when you fresh when you just freshly crack one or freshly get one poured in your pint glass it's got a nice snappy um carbonation level to it you know and i think people like that too 
Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it's getting a lot of love in the chat. It's, uh, it's a hit. So awesome. I would, I'm glad. I would I'm, agree. I'm really happy to hear that. You know, I, it's, it's fun. We were Montana only for the longest time. So we had this kind of cachet of like, come to Montana. It's the only place you can get a cold smoke. Um, now we're in uh, North Idaho, Eastern Washington, and a few parts of Wyoming. So it's not like we're, you know, all across the globe, but, you know, we're at least kind of slowly expanding um, our territory of where we sell beer in person. So nice. Um, it's, it's still kind of that, uh, you know, that, that classic trunk beer, you know, where people, people come to visit Montana and they, you know, they, there's a lot of great beers in Montana that people put in their trunk, but cold smoke is definitely one of them. Cool. Awesome. And a few other places other than Montana. That's great. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of distribution, um, Kettle House was the first Montana brewery to can its beer, I believe. Um, and that was way back in 2006, actually. So what was it like taking that leap? I mean, to be the very uh, first brewery canning, that's, that's a big step. What was that like? Well, it, it was a big step and it was a tremendous leap of, leap of faith. I mean, at the time, I've heard different stats as to where we actually rank in the national uh, craft beer canning thing. Obviously, the big boys have been putting their beer in, can for, in cans forever, um, but when we did it, you know, we really followed Dale down at Oscar Blue's lead. Um, you know, he's a smart guy and he takes risks and it shows because, you know, fortune favors the bold um, for sure. And so just to, to remember those days when we were start first getting into cans, I remember walking into my owner's office. We didn't have a high speed internet. We had this little, I was waiting for the sugar cube to buffer, you know, on the computer screen and Tim, my boss, is like, Al, this is going to be the future of our, of our brewery. And I'm thinking, oh, great. We're finally going to package beer. I want a six-pack, 12-ounce bottles. And then I'm like, okay, well, if that's not the case, I could see us doing like 22-ounce bottles. But if, and if that's not the case, I could see us doing uh, like a champagne bottle thing. Like I just had some delicious Pilsner from Stouts Brewing in Pennsylvania, and they were using these champagne bottles. Uh, they're the owners of that brewery sidebars daughter went to school in Missoula and they came into the tap room and they saw a license plate on the wall that said pills. And, uh, they're like, Oh, Pilsner, da, 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 da. And so they heard, and they sent me a bunch of beer in the mail and it was so oh, awesome. Wow. But, so anyways, the video buffers and Tim's like, here it is cast brewing systems, you know, and cast brewing systems is a small Canadian company and it had a single head filler. Oh my so gosh. Like single, like <laughs> fill one can of beer at a time, one can of beer at a time. One wow. can of beer. It took us all day to fill and package uh, one pallet of beer. And for us, that's 70 cases all day. Oh and it took like four people and it was ridiculous, but we did it. 20 and, cans per minute. Oh God. How many minutes per can, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so 20 cans per minute might be a lot faster than it was actually going. It sounds like. Yeah, totally. But I, I remember being terrified at first because there was really like a perceived notion that in a can it would taste crappy or whatever. You taste the aluminum, you taste this, you taste... And uh, our first three accounts were three local independent stores and one of them's right down the road from us, Orange Street Food Farm. And this place is a beer selling factory. Um, it still, I think, holds the title of number one PBR outlet in <laughs> the world um because they just sell so much beer um but uh so i walk into into the orange street food farm and i'm walking down the aisle and this guy's like there's that kettle house guy now and i'm like oh shit what do we do did they found like a, <laughs> did they find a candy bar and a can of beer or something you know like and the guy's like hey i'm going on the grand canyon i'll give you 50 bucks for a case of that beer and before i could even answer his question he goes no i'll give you a hundred bucks for a case of that beer and I look at our display, like we didn't, we haven't even found a uh, shelf space in the cooler yet, but they let us put a display in an end cap and it was empty. And I thought, damn, I think we're onto something. And we were, you know, back in those days, it was all brown glass bottles and the, you know, the whole, the can wrap having color all around it. At the time we had just had the, you know, like the old dolphin killer package on the top and we, uh, you know, it, it was like, it was a, a beautiful, like, bit of like billboard, you know, yeah. a sea of brown. 
So you could be halfway across the grocery store and I could see my beer sticking out like a sore thumb. Now you go to these sets and it looks like psychedelic vomit. You know, there's just like a, uh, you know, a kaleidoscope of colors, right? And it's really hard yeah. to pick something out of there. But back in those days, everyone was bottling, right? So they had the disadvantage of the brown, everything, you know? So um, it gave us a really big point of differentiation. And Montanans like to be outside and do stuff. You know, we like to camp and fish and hike and whatever. And you can put a can of beer in your fishing bag. You can put a can of beer in your golf bag and your wherever. And it's not like a bottle. You know, if you go camping, it's kind of sucks to have a bunch of bottles. You, know, you got to deal with them, whatever. But so this was the perfect beer for that. And uh, and it just kind of gave us this niche and it just took off from there. That's awesome. A uh, little bit bigger uh, canning operation you have nowadays. I you showed yeah. me when when I was there. Um, yeah, I mean the thing looks like the Death Star now. You know, it's just like, <laughs> like whirling. You know, the cans are flying off the end. Oh yeah, here. <laughs> but it's really. Uh, there it's it is. Been, yeah, totally. That's our brand new uh, palletizer. Uh, oh my ro gosh! Robot. Um, yeah i mean look at that place and it and and now the problem we're having is that now everybody's facing these bottlenecks no pun intended um in what they can receive for their empties for their you know to to put the beer in right they need cans to put mm -hmm. it in there and um you know it's man i heard uh i heard white claw lost a contract with 19 twos and if you hear if White Claw is losing a contract with 19 twos, no one is safe, let alone a minuscule operation in the cog like us. Wow. So we used to be able to, to buy, you know, pay for a year's or contract for a year's worth of cans and they'd store them on their facility and ship them to us, you know, every so often. Now they make them whenever they feel like it and we have to store them. So that picture. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look at all those cold smoke cans. Yeah, there's so many. Ugh, you know so 18 pallets of those fit on an 18 wheeler and i forget how how many cans is on one of those you know pallets they're stacked three high right there so oh. it's crazy right but hey you know uh, i'll take it any way i can get it at this point but steve wilson in the chat asks what's what is 19 two so those are the 19.2 ounce cans you don't Correct. see them many brands all day IPA is a craft brand that comes to mind for me that I always see in 19 twos. Yeah. But, um, and you, you know, years ago, everybody did a 22 ounce bottle and the 19 two kind of took over that segment. And we still stick with our 16 ounce package. And that was our original idea. So I could sell a four pack of this and they could break it apart. And it was just big enough to where we, they'd let us sneak us, sneak it in the 22 ounce cooler. Right. So we yeah. had a single that you could grab and sample. You know, we rem we all remember being broke college kids and trying to like buy nice beer and I couldn't afford it. So I'd buy like a 22 or something nice and then, you know, a 12 pack of Rainier or something, yeah. you know, cause that's, so you'd like savor your 22 ounce and then just be like, ah, all right, that was, you know, and then get down to just getting drunk, I guess, but <laughs> get down to business. Um, yeah, right. So I've been to, uh, I've been to breweries with a slide. I've been to a brewery with volleyball and pickleball courts, and I've been to a brewery with five miles of hiking trails, but I have never been to a brewery with a 4,500 seat outdoor amphitheater, uh, or yeah. at least I hadn't until I visited your beautiful Bonner location. Could yeah, you tell cool. us more? Oh my gosh. How cool is that? I mean, it's like a dream come true for me. You know, I'm a big music fan. Um, this summer we're having or there's 31 concerts, I believe, um, slated to be at the amphitheater. Oh my gosh. This summer, I mean, and we've had from Lyle Lovett to Slayer, from Ween to Primus <laughs> to um, Brandy Carlisle to, um, you know, any number of people. Um, so like this summer, I'm really excited about seeing Tedeschi Trucks Band, Los Lobos is opening for them. I'm really excited about seeing Krungbin. Um, they're amazing. Um, who else am I stoked for? I don't know. I can't think of off the top. Uh, J Rad. I'm psyched for that. Phil and Friends. Phil Lush is coming uh, next Friday, the 17th. So, 
you know, just all these cool artists that are right out our back door. And oh, poor me, part of my job is to go to these concerts and have fun with people that, that come to town. So somebody's uh, got to do it. Somebody's, somebody's got to do it. So, <laughs> hey, so I guess what I'm saying is that that's an invitation. So, you know, if you two ever show up in Missoula, please reach out and we'll go to a concert. So mm, I just might. You might have to call Brian the next time Slayer shows up. One hundred percent. Slayer. Absolutely. Slayer was awesome because it was the end of August. And, uh, you know, for better, or for worse, we do have a wildfire season here in Montana. And it was a bad wildfire season. Like it was really smoky. And I remember the day of the show, I was at this, uh, it was like 95 degrees and all smoky. I mean, what a perfect setting for a Slayer concert. Right. And, right. And and, uh, I was, I was at Warden's Deli the day of the show, this, you know, classic deli, one of our first independent stores where we sold beer. And there's these two women in front of me and they both had their black leather jackets with their patches on it, even though it was like 90, whatever degrees outside. And I'm waiting in line to get my sandwich or whatever. And they're both like, man, I hope it's smoky as F tonight. That would be so metal. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh. But it was it was so smoky that they uh, they wouldn't let Slayer do all their pyrotechnic stuff. I mean, oh no, some of that stuff wow. like when they when they're like, you know, they come on stage and rain blood or whatever starts, but you know, the curtain drops, everything's red, and then flames are just like. I could feel yeah. them in our. I could feel them in our box, you know, uh, two hundred yards away. So I was like, "Yeah, good thing there's a river of water between, you know, Slayer and the woods behind us." Um, you know, no, no trees were burned that night on our account, but or or Carrie King's account, but um, but yeah, it's uh, it's amazing having that amphitheater. Um, you know, like back to that story about the guy buying the beers for the Grand Canyon. You know, experiences are things that we always remember in life. And if you're a big Slayer fan and you went to that show and you had your first Cold Smoke and you saw a band that you'd love, you'll always think of that that Cold Smoke and that band, you know, as one big kind of homogenous like ball of love, right? So um, it's really cool to have that opportunity. Um, so we, you know, we sell a bunch of our beer in the amphitheater. They also have a wine and spirits, um, but you know, it's, it's cool to be the only beer thing in there. Wow, that nice. is cool. Beer and memory. Uh, right. Those like, yeah, that's such a special thing. And like the way that you taste beer and the way the memories come up, so cool. For um, sure. What a special thing you guys have. Um, so, you know, looking forward, it sounds like you've been in beer in Missoula forever. Looking mm-hmm. forward, um, you know, what do you think the future of beer looks like in Missoula um, or in just Montana at large? Uh, I think they'll probably be um, on similar paths, Missoula and Montana at large, in that, um, you know, the level of sophistication of the average opening a brewery that's just opening in, in Missoula or in Montana is, is very high these days. Um, 20 years ago, it was pretty low. Um, and I'm looking in the mirror there too, you know, like we, we weren't as good as we are now. Um, you know, I like to think that we've gotten better over the years. And so we've had this running start in front of everybody else. And we have all this infrastructure. We have this beautiful canning line, this big brewery where we can crank out all these cans of beer. So it's a huge advantage to have that head start over these people. But I'd say what we're going to see now is just more, um, more development, like more compartmentalization, like there's new breweries popping up around Missoula that are making great beer. Um, you know, uh, like there's one that's just down the road from me, Odd Pitch, and they're making delicious hazies and wonderful sours and crisp pilsners, you know, and so these guys have barely been open for, you know, very long at all, and they're making kick-ass beer already. So I'd say the future of uh of Missoula and Montana beer is more stuff like that. You know, more people that are raising the bar, that are making great beer, that are choosing bold styles to go with as their flagships and doing cool off the wall things to kind of kind of move the needle, you know. Awesome. Uh so we just have one more question here. Um this is kind of a question we asked all of our guests, but what is one thing that you wished Missoula was more well known for? Hmm. 
Well, I mean, I feel like Missoula is known f- for a lot of things. I tell people that Missoula is the great compromise city because it's not the best ski city. It's not the best, you know, mountain biking. It's not the best trout fishing. It's not the best this or that, but everything that it offers is pretty good. You know, so if you're kind of ADD like me and you like to hike and mountain bike and ski and fly fish and camp and whatever, you know, there's opportunities to do all those things. But I mean, selfishly, I wish it was more known for its beer. Um, I think it's getting on the map. I think that, you know, we have Big Sky, we have us, we have Byron, Draftworks, you know, we have all these breweries that are really cranking out some great beer. Um, So I think what I really wish it was known for was world-class beer. Um, And I think we're well on our way, you know, selfishly and not so humbly. Um, That, yeah, that's my answer. Well, as we talked about in our intro episode to Missoula, people just need to pay attention to the per capita numbers because Missoula's third, only behind Vermont and Maine. And uh, I think people are well aware of the beer scenes in those states. And I think Montana and especially Missoula deserves that recognition without a doubt. Every beer I had I, when I was in town was just on par, n- no flaws, just great examples of whatever style they were going for. Absolutely. And, uh, the fact you that to- you're the fact that your foot is in nature the entire time you're in the city too like yeah. it's a it's a great destination absolutely you can go to any brewery in the town in the city and have some beer that's great or some beer that you love so that's pretty cool yeah well these beers tonight have been a hit with our crowd so i think that um yeah like you said slowly you're you're definitely getting on the map you know definitely our crowd is going to be big uh, Missoula beer fans, I think, after after yeah. a couple more episodes, for sure. You know, these folks just need to stop stop at our tap room, uh, you know, on their way to the next Slayer or Tedeschi Trucks concert and absolutely sample, sample a couple of those beers. All right. You heard it, folks. That's your invitation. Make it to <laughs> Missoula. All right. Um, well, thanks for joining us, Al. Um, we had a couple of folks wondering, you know, where can they find Kettle House beers you mentioned, but could you mention again your distribution footprint? Absolutely. We're sold all across Montana, uh, wherever beer is sold, basically. Uh, Then we're sold in North Idaho. And that basically means the Panhandle, um, you know, the greater Coeur d'Alene area included. And then we're sold in Eastern and Central Washington. So basically from the state line all the way west to the Cascades in like Leavenworth area or so. Um, And then we're sold in three markets in Wyoming, uh, the Jackson market, the Cody market, and the Sheridan market. I'm kind of, you know, the latter two kind of along that I-90 corridor-ish. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at for now. Uh, Montana laws are kind of funky. You know, I can't ship beer to a customer, but we can sell to a second party and you guys can do it, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, so so that's an opportunity right there for those folks that are that are out of town. But it seems like more and more people are, you know, discovering Montana and um, and just driving through or going to Glacier, or going to Yellowstone, going skiing at Big Sky. So, yeah, that, that's our basic footprint right there. Well, I, for one, can attest to why people should go to Missoula. I think I told this to you, Al, when I was there. Uh, half Halfway through my day there, I was like, I need to figure out how to take my family out here for a vacation because we would just have a blast. And Abs- I think... Uh, absolutely. Anybody that's even interested should absolutely look into to going out there and and stop by stop by Kettle House and go to the Bonner location. It is the For it sure. is one of the most gorgeous brewery locations I've seen in my life. Like you guys have I something mean, really special there. The, that Blackfoot River is is world famous for a reason, you know. So it's <laughs> it's very humbling that we get to be a part of that. Well, thanks again, Al, and uh, thanks to Kettle House for supplying these awesome beers. Hey, uh, thank you both. And thanks to everybody that that tuned in. Uh, Hope everybody had a good time. I did. Uh, We certainly did as well. Brian, can I ask this last question from the from the chat really fast? I'm kind of curious to know the answer as well. Um, Nick says that there are some folks talking about a coffee cold smoke. Is this true, true, Al? It it is true. We sell a a version of the cold smoke that's a coffee cold smoke it is a winter seasonal so 
winter seasonals basically means October through March or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, um, we also have a lot of good coffee in this town. Um, our, our good friends at Black Coffee Roasting provided us with some cold brew uh, and we dose the we dose the beer with the cold brew once it's in the bright tank, and oh. uh, it's like you know everybody's had a you know a more of like a coffee stout kind of beer, right? Um, and that's great. That was a wonderful beer that I still really enjoy. But this the cold smoke and the cold brew really pair nicely together because it kind of allows some of the um, the lighter flavor points in the coffee to come through. You know, because the cold brew is a much more subtle thing um, than just like a standard cup of espresso or something. Yeah. Right? So, yes, yeah. yeah, it's, it's a delicious beer and I, I highly recommend it. Available in all the same places as your other beers? Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Ooh. Awesome. Full market distro on that. Well, that's awesome. Um, yes. Thanks again, Al. And thanks, MC, for co-hosting. Th thank uh, you both. Have a great yeah, day. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Al. And uh, we got one more beer left from uh, Kettle House that we'll be enjoying on our uh, special end of the month episode. But in the meantime, you can find more from Kettle House at kettlehouse.com. As always, if you're digging the show, you can support us by signing up for the beer club at brewvana.com. As a member of the Brews Less Travel Beer Club, you'll get in a, a box of amazing local beers shipped to you monthly, and you'll get to drink these same beers with us on the stream right here. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. We have a TikTok now. Follow us on TikTok. We're young and we're hip and we're going to do TikTok dances on there. You can also follow us on Untapped YouTube at Bruvana. Um, we'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, stay safe, be kind, and support local breweries. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching Brews Less Traveled on YouTube. Be sure to uh, like this video and subscribe to our channel for more interviews with brewery professionals.